Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or it's 2 a.m. Good to bed already. This is Eagle Eyes on Tech. I am Eagle Falcon. It's CES week! And by at CES week, I mean that CES ended, you know, a few days ago. But still. It's the Consumer Electronics Show! There's so much amazing vaporware tech to talk about. So before we get into it, let's go over a few of the details. For those who don't know, CES is the Consumer Electronics Show. It is the biggest electronics show in the U.S., possibly even the world. And the only reason I say possibly is because I don't know very much about other tech conventions other than like Mobile World, Con um, Mobile World Congress or Computex. And I know CES outsizes them both. There might be another one that I'm forgetting, but I'm not sure. So, in CES, there are basically two kinds of products. You have Concepts, which is the company brings out a prototype, and more than likely, you will never see it come to market, or if you do, it will look completely different. Or it won't come out until several years down the road, but it will definitely not come out this year, without a doubt. And then there's actual products. Actual products only have about a 50-50 shot of actually coming to market this year. Far too often at CES we see things like drones for the longest time until a few years ago not coming out to market. Surround sound headphones have always been a big one. They've never come out to market. <laughs> Not sure why. Everyone seems to want it, but it just, it just never happens. And then for the longest time, virtual reality was also a thing that kept saying, oh, we'll have it out later this year, and it never happens. This year is a, another exception, though, because Oculus announced they're going to launch... I want to say they launched during CES week, now that I think about it. I don't have the notes in front of me. That's just off the top of my head. So anyway... Let's dive right into it. This show was weirder than normal. It was weirder than normal for a few things. One of them is the fact that there was a lot of talk about cars. This shouldn't be a surprise, seeing as how we are finally breaking through and creating autonomous cars, self-driving cars. We're getting closer and closer and closer to the point where it could be a reality. Now, in its current stage, autonomous vehicles could exist, but only with other autonomous vehicles. If they all network together and all controlled by multiple different supercomputers that expects what each one's going to do, we would have them now. No question about it. But, A, not everyone can afford that, so there has to be some manual driving cars. And B, there's people like me who like driving manual cars. <laughs> so we're still working on creating self-driving cars that can try to predict what the human element will do. And that's very tricky because we're mind-blowingly unpredictable creatures. Such as how electric vehicles got a ton of buzz during the show for no adequately explored reason other than the fact there are electric vehicles. But I'll talk about the more interesting of the two big electric vehicle showstoppers. This is the Volkswagen Bud E concept. So Volkswagen clearly, after messing up diesel cars, decide, you know, we need to go to electric. We can't cheat emissions with electric. Which they're right, they can't. The emissions that are created by electric vehicles aren't caused by the vehicle themselves, they're caused by the power plant. Sorry, spoilers for you out there that think that because you drive an electric vehicle you're making the environment cleaner. You aren't. Pro tip. So you've got this electric van. And it's kind of cute. You know, it's basically minivan size. you got a sliding door. On the inside, you have this really cool interior, this giant L couch. 
that'd actually be really fascinating for a taxi service to use, don't you think? Just pull up everyone, get in, and just kind of crowd around, and you can just exit and enter as you please. No, None of this, okay, well, the person next to the door has to get out first, or any of that jazz. It's really cute the way they did it. There's no door handles either. There's motion sensors that you have to put your hand up against and wave. And I've seen the same technology used in hospitals for automatic door openers. But it uses that to automatically open the doors. The sliding door on the side and the two passenger doors. And a lot of these guys, these editors, were mind-blowingly impressed by waving your foot under the rear bumper to open up the back hatch. Why they're impressed with this, I don't know, because this is a technology that's existed in cars for several years. I I don't get it. But I mean, that aside, this is clearly a concept vehicle. It looks too cool and too futuristic on the inside to be coming to the market anytime soon. That's the thing with concept cars. They are fascinating to look at because it looks like the Jetson have, Jetsons have finally arrived. And then anything that's taken from the concept car that's put into actual production, every single futuristic styling is gone. It goes back to traditional seats and whatnot. Oh, I almost forgot. There is a giant LCD in the back seat that um, you can map out uh, points of interest you want to visit. And then it will take everyone that it detects in the car and map out the land, the uh, was it landmarks that they want to visit on a giant map, so you can plan out a road trip. That is really neat. I would love to see a tablet app to adopt this, but I guarantee you this is not going to make it onto a production model, unfortunately. Oh well. Anyway, that's the. Volkswagen Bud E concept. Although now that I look at the thing, I just realized what this thing reminds me of. This thing is totally the Ford Flex. It's a little stubby flat nose. It's almost well, it's it its windshield's more sloped than the Flex. It's just coming to a box end at the rear. It reminds me so much of the of the weird contraption that is the flex. Oh well. Next up is the electric vehicle that really should have been at any other CES. This should have just been looked at as oh it's just a car. And it is. This is the Chevy Bolt. Not to be confused with the Chevy Volt. The Chevy Volt is actually a very fascinating hybrid that really should be the evolution of electric hybrids. Where everything is electric motor driven and there's a gas engine to charge the batteries if the batteries run low. It's a range extender. The Chevy Bolt, with a B, Bolt, 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 Bolt. No matter how many times I say Bolt, it sounds like, yeah, it's going to sound like Volt on the mic. And that's my biggest fear, is that's going to sound like I'm Chevy, saying Chevy Volt like 50 times here. All right, get back into the subject. So the Chevy Bolt is a 100% electric vehicle. That's basically it. It's an electric car. It's got all your electric cars need. The the ability to plug in. And that's it. It gets 200 miles on a charge, which is good. You really need that range. But it's just an electric car. That's it. You got rear view mirrors. There's no real earth-shattering tech on this thing. So why it's at a tech show, I don't know. 
the only real amazing thing about it is the fact that its entry level price is $37,500, which is cheap compared to the Model S. The thing is that the Model S is clearly a luxury car. This clearly isn't. It's just an electric car. We've had electric cars before. And in fact, the thing that really irks me about it is the fact that there is still the $7,500 federal rebate because our tax dollars need to go to people who decide that, you know, we need to go get a car where any sort of emissions it would have is done at a power plant instead of from the car directly. So now it's $30,000 after a federal rebate. Uh, why is this getting attention? I don't get it. This is CES. This is where drones were first introduced. This is where virtual reality was such a pipe dream that they just kept wanting it to happen so badly. This is where freaking everything used to happen. This is where we had pipe dreams of refrigerators counting how much food is in it. Why is just an electric vehicle such a showstopper? It blows me away. It really does. That doesn't compare, though, to... Well, actually, no. Noth nothing can compare to the Chevy Bolt. That, that is, hands down, the strangest abnormality in all of CES this year. Though the razor blade stealth does definitely seem kind of really it's that what that's what counts for new tech. I mean it's new for razor. So what's the razor blade stealth? You're probably all thinking it's some sort of high tech shaving razor. It's not. Razor is a tech company that develops Gaming hardware. Gaming mouses, gaming keyboards. I have, a, I have a Razer keyboard right here. The thing is that you never hear me type on it because it sounds like this. Yeah, I bet you loved hearing that. So the Razer Blade Stealth is a laptop. And it's actually kind of a... It's an above average laptop, I'd say. No question about it. You got a high de high definition screen that's well above 1080p. You either get the 2560 by 1440 screen at the low end or a 4K screen at the high end. And it, tell it does have what the color sat what the color saturation is. The low end is 70%. The higher end is 100%. Neither one of these mean anything. They're arbitrary numbers. Let's just get that out of the way. Nobody cares. Storage reigns anywhere from 128 gigabyte SSD on the PCIe bus to a 512 gigabyte SSD on the PCIe bus. This means that boot up is stupid fast. Load times are stupid fast. Hands down. Your biggest bottleneck on this thing really is, surprisingly enough, the graphic card. For a gaming laptop, this thing only has the integrated Intel graphics. You cannot play high-end games on this laptop with just the laptop. Period. It's not happening. You might be able to play last year's games at low settings on this thing, but on its own, no, it's not happening. On top of that, the the CPU is only an ultra low voltage dual core Core i7 at 2.5 gigahertz. It's very underwhelming. I mean, yeah, the whole point is so that I mean, these specs. This isn't the specs I'd expect from a gaming laptop. These are the specs I'd expect from a laptop. 
just something that's thin and mobile. And one thing to also keep in mind is that this laptop isn't very big. It's only 12 and a half inches. Yeah, it's very slim, very slick. It's got a very shallow keyboard, though the keyboard also, each individual key can light up a different color that's all programmable. You know, it's got nice rounded corners, a big trackpad, and oh my god, I just realized this thing is mimicking the MacBook. Oh god. Razer, once again, is just making another Apple clone. Except for Gaiman. Oh, Razer. You've got two USB ports on it. You have a Thunderbolt 3 port, which is in the form factor of a USB Type-C connector. And you've got an HDMI out. So at least unlike the MacBook, you have ports. In fact, actually, the real fascinating thing is this Thunderbolt 3 port. 40 gigabits per second through this port. Bidirectional, you can do quite a lot with this port, including hooking up an external GPU, which they actually do include. It's called the Razer Core. It kind of looks like a small Mac Pro from back in the day, except it's great graded, so it looks like a giant radiator. A graphic card sits in it. It's basically a dock. It connects by the, by the Thunderbolt port, and this is how you game on it. You can only game on it with this thing hooked up because now you've actually got the graphic performance you need, underline need, to actually game. See, here's the thing. The only thing that's really new about this concept is the fact that it's a thin laptop and that it connects by Thunderbolt. Alienware did the same thing a few months ago, except their concept... What it did was there was first off it was a real product. The the actual laptop connected with a custom connector, no surprise there, and the laptop actually had gaming power on its own. Now there are things I hate about that too, which I also hate about this too. The fact that those had a low end dual core processor, which that was clearly going to be the bottleneck. And that's clearly going to be the bottleneck here, too. I mean, heck, Terra just knocks the socks off my current desktop. And I've got eight cores on this desktop. It's going to make this laptop look like a joke. Ugh. Anyway, the Razer Blade Stealth starts at $1,000. You can actually get the laptop now. The Razer Core, there is no information on it at all other than what it is. No pricing at all. So, that being said, we're going to stop there. We're going to be right back and we're going to get into the rest of CES. Be right back, guys. How did I end up here? Welcome back, Eagle Eyes on Tech. I am Eagle Falcon. So, if electric cars and cars in general were one oddity in CES, Clearly, there has to be another. The other one is something that's not unknown to CES. There's sometimes car tech within CES, but it's always just like concepts of internals, like computers for self-driving cars, which there actually were quite a few of this year, including one by NVIDIA that required water cooling from the radiator system to cool off. It was so powerful. The other one being smart appliances. A lot of the dishwashers, well not the dishwashers, the washing machines we use now, the ones that have a whole bunch of settings and then you fill up this, these, uh, these small vats within, the, um, within this tray in the washing machine. You know the ones I'm talking about, these new modern ones. Those first showed, uh, showed their faces at CES. It was considered a smarter way to do it because it could inject the soap after a flush and get all the all the various dirts off the clothes first rather than just washing it right away. And then on top of that, it could inject fabric softener at the right moment, right towards the end. 
You know, it's not something that's... That was a concept that was not unknown to the washing machine world on the commercial side, but was unknown to us on the consumer side. Why am I mentioning this? There's no reason. Absolutely none, other than because it's knowledge I know. So the smart appliances, though, that caught everyone's eye this year were refrigerators. And I don't know if these are going to catch on. The washing machines you easily could tell were going to catch on because they were actual problems that existed. With the refrigerator, it basically has one job. It's to keep your food cold. It's to preserve it. It's not like the washing machine where it was doing it poorly. It's always done it well. There's been a few little this and that that have helped along the years, such as automated ice creators, water dispensers, those sort of luxuries that were kind of neat. In addition to drawers and such, and and new systems with the doors that no matter which side of the do- of the double door system you closed first, it would still close properly. I don't know if this is going to catch on though. We're going to start off with the LG Signature. The LG Signature fridge is a four-door fridge. The top two doors are for the refrigerator. The bottom two are for the freezer. I personally think right off the bat this design is flawed. Just because the underdesigned fridge has only worked as a drawer. So you could just pull the whole thing out and there's everything. That's the only time it's really worked well, where it was convenient. Just double doors, no no one's going to want to get down on their knees to go search their fridge. Or their freezer, I mean. So already I think this is kind of flawed. And the only reason that... Now, they do no effort to try and say that this is a good idea. Because they don't show the freezer part at all, which convinces me that I'm right. That their freezer section is just a flawed design from the get-go. Their fridge design, however, it contains a very unique element. And that is on the right door for the fridge, it contains tinted glass. Normally you can't see through it. But if you knock on the glass like this, a light will come on within the fridge and let you see into the fridge through the glass. That's kind of cool. It's not practical at all. Because the thing is, is that... The one reason you have an oven light... Is because when looking into an oven... If you open it up to look at it... The oven loses, I think, 3 degrees every second... In heat. So it can very quickly cool down... When you open it up for 10 seconds... Just to see... Are your biscuits brown on the top? You know, all of a sudden you go from 350 down to 320, and that can drastically wreck how you how it bakes. Now the oven needs to work harder to try and get it back up those those 30 degrees it lost, and that could take two minutes. So that's two minutes that your oven's baking at a lower temperature. The fridge, on the other hand, it loses some temp. Don't get me wrong by opening it. But it's nowhere near as drastic as the oven. This, to me, just comes off as a gimmick. I mean, you you open and close the fridge all the time, and it does a fantastic job of, of cooling it down those extra three degrees it gains for the time that it takes you to open up the fridge, look for what you want, take out the milk because you realized, oh yeah, I came here for a glass of milk, and then close it. In fact, really, the biggest advan- the biggest thing they've ever done for temperature-saving features was automatically closing the door, which just about every fridge except for mine does. The other gimmick it has is it has a sensor in front of the fridge, and it projects, like, put foot here, or something along those lines. They don't have a picture of it in this article, but they've shown it a few times. And you put your foot 
on that area, and then a sensor picks that up, and then it opens up the door. This is cute, but I wonder how long it takes for a pet to accidentally open it. Now, LG claims that the sensor will only pick up a foot and not and not a pet. In this article, they specifically say that LG says a curious dog. This article from CNET, by the way. I don't know. I don't know how a sensor can tell the difference between a foot and a cat. But I am willing to bet that... Let me tell you a little bit something about cats. There are basically two kinds of cats. There are cats that adorably hunt for your affection. And then there are the devious cats that will do whatever they want to get whatever they want. I have one of the cats that are devious. Or I had one of the cats that was devious. It currently lives at my mom's. That cat would do anything to get at food that didn't belong to him. He would literally, and I mean, I mean, I mean this, this actually happened. He'd get up on the counter and headbutt the butter tray off the counter onto the floor, smashing it, glass everywhere, just to lick at the butter. This cat has has once before, as we were all eating dinner in the living room. Just gently nosed off the little container of Boston Market we got, just to put the chicken on the floor so he could nibble at it. You will do anything to say that, see, it's on the floor, it's mine now. And that was his mentality. I'm willing to bet this cat's going to find out, oh, it looks for my fur. Let me just rub my nose against the sensor instead. Up the door open. Now it's all mine. It, this just seems like, uh, no, I'm just, I just see too many nightmares. I really do. Oh, God. I mean, I'm curious as to how LG made it so that it only detects a foot and not a pet. Because I'm willing to bet there's a way around it. Just as there's a way around just about everything. Oh, Lord. Oh, okay. I actually I actually just glanced up in the article, and now I see the paragraph that holds the information. The pitch man for LG needed to keep his foot in place for a whole second. And that may be enough to keep, to keep straight pets f- from opening up that run by. Yeah, no. No. Devious cats will just sit in front of that sensor until the door opens, and then they'll have at it. Do not get this fridge if you have pets. Bad end. Especially if you have clever pets. I just foresee way too many problems. Don't do it. So that's one cute fridge. There's another one that got everyone talking, and I mean everyone. And it's from Samsung. Samsung's done a lot this year to get everyone talking about them. This fridge, everyone started first talking about this fridge, and as I and as I started just kind of casually during the week listening to tech listening to everyone else's tech podcasts, tech this, tech that, everyone's talking about this fridge. Which just made me go, why? It's a fridge. What's so amazing about this fridge? Well, the Samsung Family Hub Refrigerator, starting at $5,000, oh God, is a yet another four-door fridge. I've already ranted about why I think four doors is a bad idea, but we'll move on from that. And it features a few things. For starters, it features an ice dispenser, 
which is something that the LG one didn't. That makes me kind of curious as to why. Anyway, on the other door where the ice dispenser isn't is a large 21 inch touchscreen. And this touchscreen contains a lot. It can do quite a bit of things. It has it can contain recipes that you can just display on the fridge and follow that. You can just or order food food straight straight on it. You can play music. It does just about everything. It's kind of a I have mixed feelings about this because it's just first off why why is there a why why is there a touch screen on a fridge and yeah it's cool but is it really worth it I mean I guess I mean do you really want to go ahead and order food on your fridge I mean order groceries and stuff like that I mean I guess you could if you really don't care I mean, personally, as a guy who loves to cook, I'd like to just go out and get exactly what I want, with the exact grade that I want. <sighs> I mean, that's cool, don't get me wrong. It's just, I question how useful this is. In fact, really, the most useful thing about this fridge is that on the ceiling divider... Not the ceiling as in the thing that's above me right now, but the ceiling, S-E-A-L-I-N-G, the mechanism that seals the door, has several cameras on it, and with an app you can have it take a picture of what's the inside of your fridge on the go, and then it'll show you on your phone exactly what's in your fridge. So say if I'm at the grocery store, going out and going, oh, do, do I have enough eggs? I can take a picture and go... Oh, hey, look at that. I am out of eggs. Okay, I'll make sure to grab some eggs. I've done that more times than not. I'm thinking I only need X, Y, and Z for this thing I plan on. Only get home and go, oh, I ran out of A. Oops. <sighs> well, that's it for the smart appliances. There was a bunch of other stuff, including a chef robot that I really want to find an article on, or at least take notes on, that looked really, really cool, that I'm kind of torn on. But I want to get all the details on that before I really go into depth on the cooking robot. But let's move on to home theater. We have the Immerset. I'll say that slowly again. The Immerset. The Immerset is a system that rocks your chair or your couch based on whatever's on the TV. Say if you're watching Pirates of the Caribbean, maybe it'll slowly rock your, your couch back and forth as though you're on a ship. If you're on a roller coaster, it might tilt it forward or backwards based on whether you're going down or up the roller coaster. And this is what CES is about right here. These sort of oddball creations that are really cool to see in a showroom floor. But only one in a million people would ever want to get back home. It's cute. And that's about it. I mean, not to really, like, poo-poo on it, but... You know, it's definitely not for me. I don't see it for a lot of people. But it is kind of cool. Not gonna lie. Then moving on, you have a DVR from Magnavox. First off, the only reason I included this in the lineup is because, wow, Magnavox is still alive. They still exist. I can't believe it. <laughs> like, seriously, just think about it. For those who even know who Magnavox is, what was the last time you ever heard of them? When VCRs were around, right? That was the last time you heard of them. That was the last time I heard of them. 
Maybe they made DVD or Blu-ray players, but they're still around. And they made a DVR. And really, when push comes to shove, it's just a DVR. It's a good DVR. This particular one, the Magnavox TB560HP backslash F7, a model number that just rolls right off the tongue, is a DVR that can record up to six shows at once. It has line-in for camcorders. It's got a two-terabyte internal hard drive. That's a lot. It has space for an external hard drive. Huge plus there. It's got built-in Wi-Fi. And that's basically it. It's basically just a DVR. Higher-end models of the same one, you can record stuff straight onto DVDs or Blu-rays. Again, really cute. It's not earth-shattering. It's just an above-average DVR. And I applaud its creation. Because if there's one thing that is lacking behind the times, it's DVRs. Oh god. DVRs are just... It seems we've gone backwards in the world DVRs. They've gotten slower. They're using slower hard drives. They're not even using... It's just... No. Ugh. And here Magnavox is actually making something above average. Thank god. We need more competitors in the DVR market actually going, you know what? We can make this department great again. And now with that Trump pun out of the way, let's move on. Another thing about CES. You never know what you're going to find. Case in point, a giant TV built into a treadmill. What more can you say? It's a TV on a treadmill. And it's not far away at all. It is in your face. The picture they show has this TV, what, two feet away from this woman's face? Now, the whole point of this is that as you're walking on the treadmill, this, this picture continues to move as you walk to give you an immersive experience as though you're actually walking outdoors. Or through the Grand Canyon, or down a, in through, I don't know, New York, or something like that. It's cute. But oh my god, this is so just... This is so CES. <laughs> there might just be like one of these in a, in a gym somewhere, and that's it. You're never going to see these anywhere else. <laughs> it's cute, don't get me wrong. But it's going nowhere. The other real big thing at CES, and I keep saying the other big thing, but there's always a bunch of big things at CES. One of the ones there was a ton of were wearables. I'm not going to get into all the wearables because a lot of them are really boring and just include socks that sense how you live and things like that. It's just big deal. One type of wearable that everyone knows about, though, is the fitness tracker. The fitness tracker is basically just a very bland bracelet you put on. It measures your heart rate. It's got a built-in pedometer. And it'll, like, flash a light once you've hit your goal. And these have kind of evolved very quickly over the last year or two. I can't remember if... Yeah, over the last two years. Definitely. Fitbit has been kind of one of the front runners in this. Starting off with just basically a, a sweatband on your wrist, moving on to something that's more more tech related, something with like the recent ones have a display on them that are easily confused for a long dead Sony smartwatch. And then there's the Fitbit Blaze. The Fitbit Blaze, if you didn't know any better, would look like an Apple Watch. It, there's, there's a few things, though, that gives it away. First off, the frame around it is an octagon. It's not a square. The head of the watch can just pop right out. 
I'm not saying that it's going to pop up while you're pop out while you're running. That all of a sudden you're going to run for several blocks and then realize, oh, four blocks ago the the head of my watch popped out and it's dead on the sidewalk now. No, it locks into place, but you can just take it out. And it does everything you expect a fitness tracker to do. It counts your steps. It keeps tabs on your heart rate. Just all the essentials, basically. It's got a sleep tracker in there, too. More than likely, you're not going to wear it at night because you want it to charge overnight. You know, most people do. The other... The thing is, though, is that this uses a color display. Much like the Apple Watch and every other smartwatch out there. It also will tell you the time, as a smartwatch would. It would also give you notifications from your phone, as some smartwatches do. It's not a fully-fledged smartwatch, but it is really, really close. Not even kidding. And for that, I applaud it. We really could use more watches out there that that are really kind of cheap, and this one really is. It's only at $200. This Gear S I have currently on me now, I paid $300 for it. You know, total. So to see smartwatch alternatives come out that are cheaper, it's fantastic. And the fact that it's from Fitbit and they know what they're doing as far as fitness tracking goes, you know, all the power to them. So, yeah, you did good, Fitbit. Good job. Props to you. Then we move on to drones. There were a ton of drones. Quadcopters galore. There was one that stood out as the oddball in the group. Well, there were two, but I'll get to the second one later. One of them is the Parrot Disco. The Parrot Disco, I actually first heard about, oddly enough, from a local news host on the radio. He just kind of casually mentioned the Parrot Disco and also an LG OLED display concept. And the guy clearly wasn't a tech head like me, but still knew a lot of a lot of his stuff, and really also and was also able to correctly identify that there is something special about this drone. Most drones, you got to have a little bit of know how how to get it in the air. It's usually pretty simple, but there's still procedures you got to take. The Parrot Disco, on the other hand. Being a non-quadcopter, it's actually actual airplanes-like design, where its body is the camera, it's got large wings with little winglets at the end, and one propeller in the rear. You can just take this thing and literally, not figuratively, chuck it straight up into the air, and the drone will automatically stabilize itself and be ready to take flight from there. Then you control it through your tablet. Concepts like this are really, really cute, and I can't wait to see this thing hit the market. The thing is, is that I'm afraid that with the regulations that were just put in place, that stuff like this is going to start dying out, that they're not going to invest as much into these drones. I mean, really, on the whole issue of the regulations of drones, I'm kind of torn on, because... One the regulations are going to stifle the innovation that's coming from drones and really could just wreck all the sorts of possibilities of these things. On the other hand, you still need to do something to actually punish the idiots that are having these drones do stupid things like fly them too close to planes or go into violated airspace or cause national security threats by having your drone uh, drop dead into the White House. There's got to be a happy medium somewhere, and for all I know, this is it that we've got now. But, uh, I I don't know. I'm I'm torn in the whole thing, really. 
when push comes to shove. I mean, I'm, I'm not the best guy to ask ask about it. I've got an opinion, but I don't know if I'm, I have the right opinion. That's the problem. But of course, for all the good that regulations can do, there's also the bad, which of course we already talked about, and then there's the awkward. And what I mean by awkward is that there was a U.S. Marshals raid in CES. Like, flat out. Let me just read the article. This is from CNET. On Thursday, gadget lovers were treated to the sight of federal law enforcement officials packing up a booth run by Changzhou First International Trade, which makes a one-wheeled skateboard called the Trotter. Let me interject. For starters, who wants a one-wheeled skateboard? In a world of hoverboards, very quickly losing popularity, why would you think moving the, the number of wheels from two to one is a good idea? On top of that, it's not motorized. It's just... It's just there. It's, a, it's the unicycle of skateboards. Is there really that much of a of a demand for it. I didn't even know these existed until this article came out. Now, much like with every other trend I thought was stupid and then caught on, this most likely will catch on. So the story continues. The raid was prompted by an emergency motion for an injunction relief filed by California-based Future Motion, which makes a similar skateboard that balances over a single wheel, imaginatively called the One Wheel. Let me interject. Uh, really? The one wheel? This market isn't even born yet. And already, I have no hope for it. The U.S. Marshal Service actions highlighted tensions at the country's biggest consumer ga- gadget trade show over cheap knockoffs and copycats. The annual Las Vegas show often fe- features bar... Bargain basement tech that appears to, appears to closely resemble existing products, some of which are protected by patents. The trotter, which looks like the one wheel, can be found on uh, on Alibaba for about five fifty, where the one wheel retails for about fifteen hundred on the manufacturer's website. Let me interject. Why is this fifteen hundred dollars? It's fifteen hundred dollars because. <laughs> They think they have the only one. You want to know why this isn't going to catch off? It's because the only one that's out is $1,500. I don't even think for $550 it's going to take off. This whole concept seems like one that's dead on arrival. Now, granted, it's new. But the whole reason you have counterparts like this, or the whole reason you have competition... It's for those reasons, because the guy who originally makes it just goes, hey, look, we're going to overprice the crud out of this. Now, I'm actually very curious as to what the patent details on this, because this whole thing seems too simple to patent. It really does. Uh, The whole thing comes off as weird to me. On one hand, you have... Offshore's company trying to rip off an American company on their unique product that's patently protected. So clearly, the Trotter's at fault in that regard. On the other hand, you have a product that's mind-blowingly stupid. I mean, it's just balance on this board, and maybe you can steer it. There is a small two horsepower motor in this thing. I was actually wrong because the picture makes it look there's mo- no motor. There is apparently a motor. It might actually be in the wheel somehow. It just, ugh. I don't even. I, I don't even know what to say about it. Here's the thing, though. Hoverboards currently are quickly dying off because the batteries in them that they're trying to pack in there 
just end up exploding. And for the record, when I say hoverboard, I'm talking about these handleless segways. They're basically segways without the steering handles. You just basically lean forward and they go. Lean backwards, they go in reverse. Lean on one leg, it turns, and so on and so forth. That's a hoverboard. That cool hovering skateboard that you learned from Back in the Future, that's not a hoverboard. Those are currently having trouble shipping around because shipping services don't want to deal with them. So what chance does this thing have? Doesn't seem like much to me. Uh, this whole article is just so silly. Really, when push comes to shove. I mean, clearly, the trotter's in the wrong here. However, in my mind, one wheel is also in the wrong here for having been made in the first place. It just doesn't seem like something that's going to catch on at all. But that's enough of that. I, I need to get my sanity back. Because coming up next, we've got the awards of CES. We'll be right back, guys. <laughs> Welcome back, you guys, on Tech. I am Eagle Falcon. we got one last thing to talk about for CES this week. We will talk about more in following weeks, after certain information reveals itself. And what we got to talk about are the awards. There are always awards handed out before they were done by CNET. Last year and this year, they're done by Engadget. We'll get more into that later on. But let's start off with this. The best startup of CES. The best startup product. This goes to the Owlet. Owlet. I say it slow like that because it sounds like I'm saying outlet. And I'm not. The Owlet is a smart sock that is worn by a baby. It monitors their oxygen blood levels, it monitors their heart rate, and it'll signal an app if it, if the child's heart acting starts acting strangely, put, bringing up uh, early, early possible problems. And it's, it's actually kind of cool. I got nothing, nothing against this one. It's actually a legitimately nifty product. So, yeah, I'm okay with that one. Let's move on. The best digital health and fitness product. The Omibod Love Life Crush. Fitness and health doesn't necessarily have to be a watch that tells you how quickly you've run in the last 10, 10k. Omibod Love Life Crush is a device designed to improve a woman's sexual function by training their kegel muscles. What is what? Like, legitimately what? Really? We have socks that measure your heart rate. We've got the little feety, the little uh, baby socks in the previous award that measures the amount of oxygen in the bloodstream in a child. And... An exercise toy for female sex is what gets the award. Really? Frickin' really? There's fitness trackers out there now in CES that legitimately look like an actual watch. Some of them that are actually real cost effective. There's whole shirts that, that measure a wide array of things. There's devices that track your sleep seamlessly while you're resting. But no. The borderline sex toy is what gets the award. Are you serious? Now, maybe, just maybe, my bias as a guy, as a male, 
is interfering with my judgment on this. Just maybe. But it just seems to me that if you're going to name anything the best of anything, pinning down a product that, by definition, can at most only have half the population as its target audience, just seems like an oversight. I mean, unless that product solves a massive problem. This doesn't seem to be a massive problem. I'm not crazy, am I? I I just... I, I don't even. This... Really? Okay. Alright, Engadget, you're the boss. Best wearable. The Recon Empire EVS. It is a paintball helmet with a heads-up display within the helmet. It basically, when you're in a paintball game, gives you all the heads-up information you'd normally have in, say, a video game. That's kind of cool. Again, in a CES where you have shirts, pants, and socks that me- that measure your your health stats and a whole array of other things and other bits of eyewear that can let you see the field of view of a drone following you or the Intel helmet for construction workers that can see possible dangers and can also display instructions as to which valves to close next. This seems like kind of, uh, I don't know, it doesn't seem like the best to me. At the same time, this is the consumer electronics show, not the electronics show. So maybe the commercial application of the Intel construction helmet shouldn't fit the category of best of the consumer electronics show. I guess, but I don't know. It just, I don't know. I'm just going to move on. Best automotive technology. The Chevy Bolt EV. Are you kidding? Really? Really? That's the best automotive technology. In a CES that has several supercomputers on a chip to calculate flawlessly autonomous driving with no need to access a server elsewhere. A cheap electric car is what gets the best automotive technology. No, I call bullshit. This is complete bull ploppy. 100% bull poop. BS. 100%. But more importantly, it's a good car. That's pretty much the whole punchline of the whole thing. It's a good car. It's not a great car. It's not the best car. It's just a good car. That's all it amounts to. It's just an electric vehicle. Get over yourselves. That's it. It's not like having an electric vehicle is groundbreaking like it was when Tesla announced the Model S. We've got several. There's the Model X. There's the Model... There's there's the Model X. There's the Model... There's the... What is it? The, the Ford... Uh, the Ford Focus Electric. There's the Chevy Volt. There's the Nissan Leaf. There are plenty of electric cars out there. The problem right now is the charging technology. The problem is generating cheap, renewable electricity. And currently, no, we don't have the technology for cheap, renewable electricity. We have the technology for expensive, inefficient, renewable energy. But we can create cheap energy using consumable fossil fuels, which is currently what we're stuck with right now. As much as every other eco-nut wants to say, no, we have to switch to solar. Ugh. The bottom line is we're not there yet. 
And quite frankly, electric vehicles are still really in their infancy. They are an alternative fuel vehicle. There are plenty of alternative fuel vehicles. There's diesel. There's compressed natural gas. There's liquid natural gas. There's propane-powered cars. You name it, it's out there already. All this is is just, it's electric. The end. This is not the best automotive technology. This isn't even subjective. There's a better electric vehicle already on the CES floor. That is better than the Chevy Bolt. They put as a subnote that Roberto Baldwin, senior editor at the bottom of this award, I assume that means he's the one that made the call. Let that sink in for a minute. And then tell yourself, do you, should you trust anything this guy says anymore? Because he is clearly blind. Best home theater product. The Philips Fidelio E6 Detachable Speaker. Really? A portable surround sound system? I guess. It's kind of cool. But that's the best? Was the show really underwhelming in this category? If so, does that mean we should probably just group TVs back into home theater product? In fact, wait, no. There were plenty of DVRs out there that were more innovative than this. This is just... I mean, these are just Bluetooth speakers. We've already got one. I've got one right here. It currently looks like a radioactive power core because it's got a light show on it. Now, granted, it's not a surround sound system, but I can wirelessly connect multiples of these, if I had the money for it, into a surround sound system. No problem. It, uh, this... No, this isn't the best. There's got to be something better out there. Oh, moving on. The best connected home product. What does that even mean? Best connected home product. My workstation here is a product at home and it's connected. Is that a connected home product? The Bluetooth speaker behind me is connected and it's a home product. My TV is connected and it's a home product. My router is connected and it's a home product. What what is it? What even is a connected home product? Is this supposed to be your product for the for the Internet of Things, for smart devices, for home automation? If so, then your product category is just terribly written. Anyway, the the Cassia Hub won it, which is a Bluetooth router that extends Bluetooth ranges. Really? A repeater? A wireless repeater specifically for Bluetooth. What? That's like naming a tire the best in show at a auto trade company or auto trade show it just doesn't make sense <sighs> best innovation it goes to the Volkswagen Bud E quick charging system this should have won the automotive area. Hands down. This charging system can charge the Volkswagen Bud E's batteries from 0 to 80 in 15 minutes. This is a major step forward. 
for electric vehicles. That's one of the huge disadvantages is that it takes forever to recharge your vehicle. I think, what is it? Uh, Tesla got it to, I want to say, 30 minutes with their quick charging system. They also demonstrate they can go faster by having manned service stations that just swap out the batteries flat out, which is adorable. But not every place can have that. It's eventually just a huge cost. To be able to just charge up a battery at 80% in 15 minutes, I mean, as long as it doesn't just ruin the batteries by doing it and therefore cause a whole lot of battery waste to end up in the in the landfills much quicker, I'd say kudos. Fantastic. We'll see what it ends up doing down the road. So let's move on. The best mobile device. The Huawei Mate 8. That's Mate, M-A-T-E, and 8, the number 8. I know, it's just something that just rolls off the tongue. But anyway, the neat thing about this is that it's a it's an above-average phone. It's a nice 6-inch Pro phone, also called a phablet by those of you who hate the English language. And it's, it's nice and big. It's got either 3 or 4 gigs of RAM. It's got an octa-core processor in it. It's got a good camera. It's got... It's got Android 6.0 on it. It's an overall above-average phone, and it's on the cheap. I mean, it's it's nice. All around nice. I got nothing against this thing. In fact, it's really just more of a sign that uh, Huawei, a company that used to be known for being ultra-cheap China Corp phones, is really coming out on its own as a phone maker that is competing with the big boys. And props to them. The big boy phones really need to be shooken up. I mean, my how much was my Samsung phone off contract? Like seven, eight hundred dollars. If I went and paid for it all, all up front, that's kind of ridiculous. I'd love to see that market get shooken up. It really needs to be. So we move on to best TV. Does it even matter what I say? You already know the answer. You know it's going to be some OLED TV, and all OLED TVs are basically the same unless the software is different, and almost all of them have the same features in the end, because they're all keeping up pretty much the same way, because there's barely any innovation that's being done on the actual front uh, of TVs in a long time. There's plenty of concepts out there, such as the enormous uh, enormous stitched-together TV, or all the curved displays that LG's doing. So you already know that the best product can only be something that's not a concept. And of course, it's the LG OLED G6. You didn't know it was going to exactly be that, but you knew it was going to be a giant OLED TV. So, there's no point talking about it. It's a TV. Let's move on. The best gaming product. The HTC Vive Chaperone. Really? That's the big one? The HTC Vive Chaperone are the controllers used for HTC's virtual reality headset. And they're just they're just controllers. They're motion controllers with buttons on them. They're basically more advanced Wiimotes. That's it. The end. I mean, I don't know why something like Razer's gaming laptop didn't make it. That that was kind of a neat deal. I think it's neater than this. I don't know why any other actual headsets, any gaming headsets, won. No, the controllers did. Okay. It's, that's weird. Moving on. Best offbeat product. Okay. Once again. What even is this category? Offbeat product. What does that mean? 
Who decided these category names? I want them to write an essay explaining what all of these categories exactly are. This makes no sense. Offbeat product. Oh, it's out of the norm? You're at CES. Everything is out of the norm! Every single flippin' thing is out of the norm. How can one thing be more out of the norm than others? You're at CES! Ah. Uh. The winner is actually really cool, though. It's the E-Hang 184. It is a quadcopter drone that is big enough for carrying a person. You step into this thing. You pick your destination on the on the map there, and the and it just takes off and flies you there. Very neat. It's not going to be available anytime soon. It's clearly a concept object, so it makes me wonder why is it even the best of anything if it's a concept, and clearly we've established with some of our other poor choices that concepts can't win. So, yeah, it's really cool. I really hope we see this to market in two or three years. And I really hope it can last more than 22 minutes down the road. That's all it can last. And I do hope that eventually it does get clearance by the... AAV? Or AVA? I can't remember what the government agency that controls uh, airspace is now. It's kind of irrelevant at this point. So, moving on. Best maker-friendly technology. Come on, you can guess this. You can guess what it's going to be. It doesn't take long to figure this out. Okay, Lego won. I mean, come on. If you knew Lego was at... If you knew this was a category and you knew that Lego was at the convention, you knew they won this. Best maker-friendly technology? Of course. It's Legos with robotics in it. In fact, actually, do I need to say anything more? It's it's Robo Legos. You make something, you can program it with an app, and then the robot will move on its own, based on how you coded it. It's very neat, and I see it in a lot of various education departments. Very neat. So we move on. Best PC. Oh boy, here we go again. (laughs) Now here's the interesting thing. There were a lot of computers at CES. Nobody covered any of them except for the Razer. Dell had new OLED screens in some of their laptops. Dell also introduced a netbook. Lenovo introduced a modular tablet. There's all sorts of really neat things. But of course, because Razer just gets undeserved fanfare, their Razer Blade Stealth gets the ticket. Yep. What else can you say? But here's what really ticks me off is the article they write for this. Razer is known for its thin and light gaming netbooks. This is true. And the new 12.5-inch Stealth Blade is no exception. Let me interject. Yes, it is! It is an exception because it can't game on its own! Come on! I can't be the only person who notices this. The fact that it doesn't have a graphic card on its own. The article continues. But in addition to be compact, it works with an external dock, granting gamers access to desktop class GPUs along with the amenities of Ethernet for USBs and for USB ports. Through, though Razer isn't the first attempt at this sort of setup. The Blade Stealth is noticeable for skewing property connectors. This uses th- Thunderbolt 3.0, a common standard that would allow the dock to work with a wider range of PCs. Let me interject. No, it wouldn't. You would need the software to be compatible with this dock. Razer is only going to design 
the dock to work with their stuff. They're only going to they're only going to make the drivers so that those two can talk together. This isn't some sort of universal standard. The connector is. The software to make the two talk to each other is not. Not by a long shot. The story continues. In a field of PCs at this year's CES that mostly indicated a skinny mini machines, the one that stood out was the one that didn't compromise on performance. It did! Did you even look at the machine? I did. It sure as heck compromised on performance. It's a dual core processor in 2016. I have an octa-core processor in this desktop that is eight years old. There is no graphic card in this thing except for the generic Intel integrated one. I cannot be the only person who notices this. Who wrote this up? Dana Woolman. Dana Woolman, you can't read. This is simple stuff. I didn't even have a chance to talk with anyone at Razor. I went to their site, their website, and looked up the specs. This is just common sense. You are terrible at your job. Uh, moving on, we have best robo or drone. A robot, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is a category that was pretty much just made last year because drones took off like a rocket. We have the Yannick Typhoon H drone. Right off the bat, this seems like kind of a downer, but this is a drone that has a real sense camera. That senses depth. With this camera, the drone can autonomously dodge obstacles. They even, during the demonstration, had a tree fall down in real time and the drone avoided it without anyone touching it. Now, this could all just be one giant demonstration and someone was just piloting it off, off stage. If that's the case, then shame on these guys and shame on Intel. But I'm sure is I'm hoping it's not. All right, so we move on. Best in show. Just take a guess. Best to show. What was the best, most fascinating, the most wow me thing at, at all of CES? Whatever you just said is better than what actually won it. The Chevy Bolt won. Come on! Really? The Chevy Bolt, that is the best of the best? That is the, that is the most wow-me thing at all of the show? No, it wasn't the robot with the projector in it. It wasn't the Segway robot that answers doors. It wasn't the, the baby sock that measures whether, th whether their blood is circulating properly. It wasn't the supercomputers in a car that assist dr driverless, te driverless technology. See, this has me so frustrated I'm losing my words. It's just, just really? It's a cheap electric car. That's it. Come on. Did you even try? Was there a backroom bribe that caused this? Because I would have ranked the drone higher than the Chevy Bolt. The drone at least shows a lot of potential future technologies. The drone can actually change a lot of things, especially with Amazon thinking, okay, well, we're going to try and make a drone deliver small packages. Heck, Google's trying to make drones that will deliver emer emergency provisions or first aid kits. The drone technology would definitely make that more viable for, for the emergency drone than the Chevy Bolt would for anything. It's just a car. 
It is literally just a car. The only thing that's different about it is the fact that it uses an alternative fuel. It uses electricity. That's it. This was also cited to be Roberto Baldwin. I'm very curious as to what this Roberto Baldwin person is in person. Because I'm willing to bet that he's just one of these hippies that just blindly listens to everything he's ever told about how awesome the slightest thing can to save the environment. And in the moment, with that, and just blatantly ignore the fact that, you know, dumping off lithium batteries in a landfill can cause more poison to the planet than any gas or diesel powered car ever would. <sighs> And of course, if you know anything about CES, you know that Razer won the People's Choice Award. Razer always just gins up its gaming fan base to just vote in droves for them. It won in a landslide with 42.24 of the vote. Of course it did, because nobody else cared enough. Razer just loads the votes in their favor by just flooding their social media accounts with it. But again, it's just... Uh, it's not that good of a laptop. It just flat out isn't. It's cute, but it's not earth-shattering. That's it for the awards. But that's not where we're going to end it here. I want to talk about one last thing at CES that really sums up CES in a nutshell. And that is an exoskeleton that lets you feel how it feels to age. This is one of the dumbest things to ever come out of CES. It is strange, it is weird, it is so obscure, it has no practical purpose other than for education and to tell you to stay young forever, to go find that fountain of youth. It intentionally makes it hard to move on your joints. It intentionally impairs your vision using a virtual reality headset and cameras. It can intentionally impair your hearing by covering your ears with noise-canceling headphones and then altering what its microphones on the outside of the headset pick up and then feed them to you. To make it to simulate aging hearing loss. And, I mean, really, when push comes to shove, this is pointless. This is absolutely pointless. It's really cool. It's really weird. It's really stupid. But this is what CES is all about. Going through and just saying, you know what? We can make an exoskeleton that makes you feel old. Why? Because we can and we have the technology to do it. This is what CES is about. Not about saying that a cheap electric car is the best thing to ever happen to the planet ever. It is this sort of stuff. This is what CES stands for and that's what I want to get across today. If anything else. Is that CES is just one giant show of all the weird and strange out of technology that just makes you giggle at the fact that it exists. And that's it for me. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at eaglefalcontech at gmail.com. I'm out of here. Have a great day, everyone. And if it's late, go to bed. Rest well and actually eat something if you haven't already. It's actually kind of surprising how many people I know that manage to just forget to eat. Take care, everyone. <laughs>